G'day everyone, how are you going? Gordy's Gas Bags, back in action again. Uh, this is episode eight, I can't believe we've made it this far. Corona is still with us, going strong. Um, without a doubt, uh, I know everybody out there in netball land has, but I have had private messages, text messages, phone calls, everyone requesting the plumster to come on Gordy's Gas Bags. <laughs> and so I put in the phone call and she obliged. Norma Plummer, you bloody champion. How are you going? I'm good. <laughs> Not bored, good. I'm good. You know? Well, well you... Stop. I'd like, you know, this is just, uh, yeah, not an inside person all the time. So it's a bit yeah. sad, really. What have you done around the house? Because everyone's doing oh, stuff around the house. God. Heaps. Did the garage, got racks to put together and then, you know, be able to hang things up on the wall and get them out of the way. Then uh, cleaned out the pantry. Amazing what you can find in there that's out of date. <laughs> what, what was the oldest? <laughs> yeah, what, what was the oldest date you found? <laughs> oh, something about fourteen or fifteen. To, oh. <laughs> you know, just fourteen or fifteen spices that had never been used. Um, and then uh, after that, I did my um, wardrobe, heaved out stuff there because um, I haven't been able to take it anywhere yet. Yeah. And then um, after that. Uh, Oh, I have this massive big um, oak tree. It's in the backyard, but it's actually next doors. Yeah. And I'm talking 50-odd-year-old tree, so it's huge. Well, 8,000 acorns later that I rake up and have to put in bins, you know, that's keeping, that's keeping me fit. And um, decided then to wash the windows. So, yeah, I've been doing a bit, but I'm running out of time now. I'm not time, but jobs. Jobs. That's what I'm worried about. I kind of feel like everyone's getting right into the thick of COVID and going, right, okay, let's make the house as good as it can. I'm one of those people. I had a list of 35 things. I'm 30 through them. And we're only we're only three weeks in, Plum. <laughs> I'm a bit worried. Yeah, Unless I, I build another story on my house, what am I going to do? <laughs> I know, that's what I mean. I think I've decided I might have to start doing agility sessions in my backyard. I can't go walk down the street even. <laughs> you watch. There'll, there'll, be, there'll be people asking you to come up with your own show and do agility sessions. Hey, um, all right, so I was kind of thinking about this and I thought if I get a, ha if I get a chance to have a chat with you, um, we can't just go down the normal road of interview because you've had more interviews than probably any netballer in history and most people have know you inside out so we've got to delve somewhere that people don't know so what about well, you can delve right pretty now? yeah you can delve for, and like because i thought of it the other day i thought my god I, you know over all the years and all the um players i've coached gosh i've been lucky oh. you know like, I mean, some of the names, when I look back and think about it, you know, back to the, like, the 70s, 80s, 90s, like, you know, real stars. And it's been a sensational life to be yeah. able to have, you know, had an input on some of that. And, um, yeah, but I've got a couple of stories. And, by the way, I do know it's McKinnis. <laughs> seeing I have to write it every other day on a form to put her name on the sheet to play so uh, m-c-k-i-n-n-i-s simone uh yes it's just that my voice croaks away these days and it's getting worse i might add not better but um and there's a couple of stories i'd like to tell you about the victorian team and then uh and that was in 86 and we won the national championships in darwin and the next year was 87 and we won the um with the Melbourne uh, team at the time, the Melbourne Blues, we won the 87 um, Super League then, not... Yeah. not uh, again, mobile which Super, was the extension was mobile of Super League? Yeah, the Mobile League. Yeah. yeah, it was the Ansett League, it was yeah, the Mobile yeah. League, it was the SO League. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. changing the name every other week. But um, anyway, to start off, uh, the 86 one was sort of funny because... We're going up to Darwin, so we had to, uh, I had to think about, well, how am I going to, you know, really, we're going to be playing in heat, fatigue, you know, and the humidity to start with, 
but we were playing at evening. But anyway, but I got Netball Victoria to lock down Royal Park, the old Ann Henderson Stadium there, on a Sunday morning. And I got them wearing raincoats or um, wrapping themselves in plastic. And we would run the four courts and do fartlek, you know, where the back person runs up and sprints to the front. And we had to build it up to do like 15 minutes, 20 minutes the next time, you know, 20, get to 30 minutes, continuous running. And I always remember Chris Harris. Um, Harry just could never make the front on the sprint. You know, everybody <laughs> would go past. And we were running around. But it really did set them up, for, like, quite the, like the fitness side of the things. And, um, you know, Sue Hawkins, Jane Searle, um, you know, Rosalie Jenke and uh, Simone. Like, anyway, they were all there. But um, this particular time we decided when after training, I used to work for Adidas. I worked with Adidas for 13 years. And then um, a guy called Leroy Huckstep, who was one of the reps, you know, unfortunately he's passed on these days, but Lee was a runner for Richmond. And he yep. said to me, I looked, at, we're having a family day. He said, why don't you bring all the girls over after training? And and we we had, remember you have to get the bottles of wine, you used to have to sell them, you know, to you know, fundraise and all yep. that. It was absolute shit wine but anyway you used to have to try and sell it so um i said to the girls would you like to go and they all said oh yeah so they all you know we because you hardly have a shower at royal park in those days yeah, they yeah. Just got cleaned up in the odd ones that they had there and uh, we went over to the richmond ground and went in and then i walked in and i thought hmm doesn't look too much like like a family day, there was plenty of the footballers there and plenty of the, you know, the younger girls around, but I didn't see too many kids in that. And of course, it turned out it was more like a rock concert, right? And so I, um, I can remember uh, I was watching all the girls and, you know, they're chatting with all the guys and um, you've got uh, Janie Searles, she, she was a cop at the time, so she knew a few of the boys were cops, so she's trying to sell them the wine, um, you know, because... <laughs> Ray Jenke was playing with Hawthorne. So um, Rose is talking to a couple of the guys that knew Ray and I saw Mona's down the back pocket. I don't know what she was doing, but anyway. And then they had what they called um, the Miss Hoot competition. And Shelley Haynes, Shelley Endersby as she was in, she actually gets up, we all voted her and we shove her up on stage and she wins Miss Hoot. Right? Miss Hoot. <laughs> Miss Hoot. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so as the night went on, I've got, um, Di Honey comes up and said, oh, plum, um, I'm going now. And she's going off with, I think it was the full forward from bloody Richmond. <laughs> Next minute, Janky saying to me, listen, Plum, I won't need a lift home. I'm, I'm right. And they're going off. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I'm going to get shot, you know. And sure enough, by the time I get home, it's about 11.30, I got... Um, Barb Honey ringing me on the phone like, Diane's not home. Like, where is she? <laughs> Oh, well, actually, I actually don't know, Bob. But they are over 21, you know. It's like, you know, I couldn't sort of tell them they couldn't go. But I kept thinking, my God, I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> anyway, it all worked out well and they had an absolute ball. But I, I do remember that one because it was so funny. I mean, you know, when we got there and I'm thinking it's a family day. <laughs> well, well, like, that they were conflict. You, you've probably watched a few of the Gordy's gas bags and I've chatted with quite a number of the, the girls you're talking about. And I mean, the days are different, aren't they? Because you, yeah. you trained hard and you played hard both on and off the court back then, didn't you? I mean, I mean that was the times. But we, we weren't sort of locked into full daily training environments either. So, you know, you had your time for your social bit. But I just thought it was a good team building exercise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out it was because we won the nationals. It was sensational. <laughs> Most but important. Next, yeah. But then the next year, um, when we come up against the AIS, which wasn't a... Uh, under 21 program then so oh Chris Dalwood was in that with Shelley O'Donnell um, as I said Katrina Wag um, oh, a few of the others are oh, um, Kylie Agus you know some oh. really good players from the past and brilliant players anyway we play in the grand final of the Super League and um, and we got up I can remember three quarter time Deanne Lindsay had the ball for a penalty shot and, and Harry, in her wisdom, run under the post. 
in the end, passed it to her. Oh. <laughs> it's a penalty shot. It's the end of that quarter. You've got to take the shot. So I wasn't happy with that one. As we walked off, I said, Deanne, it's about knowing the rules here. <laughs> you know, so, because um, it's goal for goal, right? So we get into the last quarter and we got up and won it. So it was fantastic. And I think I even it was cheeky enough to say to Will, I think this one's mine, Will, you know. <laughs> Why well, I said that, I don't know, but I can still remember saying it. But we thought, well, you, you didn't have the clubhouses, you couldn't go. Like, so we thought you didn't have Elk like, in the changing rooms and, and your own team room, you know. So we decided we'd go over to the Carlton Hotel and we'd go in there and we'd, you know, have a bit of like a meal together and a few drinks and try and celebrate this fantastic win. Um, so we get over to the hotel in Carlton and my... Team manager, little Patty Chapel, she's just sensational. Yeah. She actually, um, you know, I said to her, get some food because they haven't eaten, you know, like they've been playing. But, of course, they got stuck into a few drinks by this stage. And after about half an hour, an hour, from maybe an hour, I see Deanne, Lindsay and uh, Simone, and they've headed up, and they've had a few by this stage, I might add, <laughs> they've headed up onto the stage grabbed hold of the microphone and there's about half a dozen or maybe a dozen guys sitting in this lounge, you know. It was like, because it was a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon, I can't remember which, but it was a weekend. Yeah. And then they started, your mother thinks you're ugly, you're ugly, you're ugly. And this singing to these guys, your mother thinks you're ugly, you're ugly. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God. So I, I said to Pat, like, what are we going to do? I said, we can't let them drive home. So we had to get a couple of motel rooms around the corner. <laughs> there. And, of course, the boyfriends are ringing up as well. You know, where are they? Uh, oh, look, um, we thought we'd best like to kick on a bit longer, and uh, but we've got a couple of rooms. You have to ring up the mothers again. And I'm thinking, God, I'm gone again. I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> they all go off their head. <laughs> so I've had some funny times. But, Mona, yep, I got you back on that one. Your yeah. mother thinks you're ugly. And I've never <laughs> forgotten it. <laughs> I, look, honestly, it's, um, I laugh now because I look at Simone now, you know, like the, you know, oh, she seems to be the bloody topic of Gordy's gas bags at the moment, but, you know, she's, I made that comment that I remember I asked you one day about who you thought would least turn into a coach and you said, oh, Simone, without a doubt, Simone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, she used to come into training and sometimes she'd be, bit uptight no you know you could always tell and the girls would look at me and I'd say I'd just move out and then I'd say to Stacey uh, Crane uh, Stacey West now yeah. right you're with Simone because she'd get out and start training with her and next minute she'd be laughing you know yeah, yeah. but sometimes she'd turn up and she wasn't in the mood I think she said on your show I used to pick up my bag and go and she did I think a couple of times I told her to pick up the bag and go anyway yeah. so um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um yeah look I uh, but always never let the team down. It was yeah. just sensational. So um, it's it's funny when you look back and I thought, no, no, she'd never coach. I really didn't. Yeah. I did think yeah. Ella would. Um, I thought she would move into it. Even Chihuahua wasn't sure about it. But yeah. look, I'm just wrapped. I just love to see all those ex-players with that much experience giving back to the sport. Right? See? And it's That's important. That's all I ever wanted to do. Yeah, and it's important, Plum, isn't it? Like, at the end of the day, our sport, our sport only thrives on, on those of us that have come through, isn't it, really? At the end of the day, it's yeah. critical. It'll be, it'll be really interesting to see from this modern day of netball which of the players in our system turn over down the track into being the leaders of our sport. Yeah, well, you see, and the difference, too, is, like, um, you've got, like, they play for a longer age group, mm. uh, you know. I think uh, the 63 World Championship team with Joyce Brown and New, uh, June Cedar and all them, they're only about 21 or two when they actually mm. retire. Like, I mean, that's just starting out these yeah. days. So, you know, and they're going through to, well, look at Van Dyke, 44 or something, but, you know, hopefully we don't have any going that long. But I, <laughs> but I think, you know, it well and truly, you know, 36, 37 is getting up there and um, they're still giving such good performances. So um, then they go off and then the next minute they're having their families. So sometimes they're a bit later getting back into the coaching situation. Yeah. I was just lucky that I was always playing coach. As I said, with Melbourne Netball Club, we didn't have the coaches. And 
I had a husband that actually supported it. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't care. He didn't mind. So yeah. you know, I owe a lot to Chaz because he used to look after Brooke. <laughs> yeah. God, uh, you know, and ha, ha, what, what year did Chaz pass away? Yeah, in 1984. We only oh, really wow. had about 12 years together. And, mm. yeah, yeah, the cancer sure. was a vicious one. Yeah. Yeah. Plum, I remember you made a comment about, <clears throat> I think it was about Natalie Avellino once when you brought her back into the Aussie side and people yeah. questioned you about, you know, why you did that. And I think at the time she was around about, am I right in saying she was about 28, 27, 28 years of age. And I remember you making the comment and I really, like it really resonated with me because you said, you know what, a netballer's brain doesn't really develop until around about 27 or 28. Like they can be a great athlete and they can play the game and look good. But the reality of the situation is, is that their brain ticks over around about that age. And you, you thought Natalie Avellino was a prime example of that. And for me, as a up and coming coach at the time, that really resonated with me because it's, I think it's really true, isn't it? That you see these great players, you know, you look at the Lizzie Watsons and that of the world, but they're only really now just starting to develop their netball brain. Yeah, there's a, I used to study it a bit, I guess, after doing all the coaching and I, you know, like when you're under 17s, 18s, you're learning the game. And really then when you make the top, you've got to actually play for about five years before you really start to, you know, hook into the actual game. And, um, you know, then playing at that, you'll see the maturity come within the game. And then after about 26, I used to say, well, you know, they've, they've built all that now. Now the brain will take over. So you don't have to be the fastest, the quickest or the high flyer because you can outthink the opposition by that stage. And, and I think, um, uh, I had watched Nat play in New Zealand and she really, she looked as fit as I'd ever, ever seen her. And I just thought we could use a bit of flair. And, um, you know, she, you were right when you spoke to her about her hands. Mm. Um, the trouble was, yeah, a lot of people just did not get it as far as she went with her uh, ability to be able to see the space and put the yeah. ball out there. I actually would have loved to have played with her mm. because I reckon I'd have had a fantastic connection brain wise with her because, you know, she just had, she was able to see that space and some of them would just didn't, you know, like yeah. they just didn't get it. And I, yeah. and I always thought that was the hard thing for her, but yeah, she, um, she was uh, outstanding in that way, you know, as far as skill. Yeah. When you look at Suncorp Super Netball now, if you could grab one or maybe two players out of the league and say, geez, I'd love to coach them. I said this to Simone the other day and she, she was a bit stunned by because she loves to grab the young kids and develop. And I know that's certainly a major, major strength of yours is finding, you know, that diamond in the rough, pardon the punt. But if you could grab a couple of players out of the league today from any of the teams, who would they be? Well, I grabbed two with Victorious and Pums and Mawaili. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too bad. Um, and, uh, to be honest with you, I'd love to coast Lizzie Watson. Mm. I don't think she's taken the next step yet. I think she's got a lot to her game. And as a centre player, which I played all my life, and, you know, I see her wing attack, I reckon she'd have killed it in centre. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I still, I know she goes there sometimes, but I'd still like to, even on the wing attack bit, I think you could cut down the work, the workload a bit on her and she, her timing on it to the top of the circle yeah. would be heaps better still. Yeah, some yeah. more, more I, I, I really think she's a beautiful athlete. Yeah, yeah. I've got her, I've got her earmarked as an ex-Australian captain. Oh, okay. Mm. Well... I wouldn't be a, um, against that at all. I yeah. think, yeah, she's, she's definitely earned her stripes to be there. Very, very level-headed, uh, very humble person. I think she'll, she'll yeah. be a fantastic leader. Um, yep. What if? Let me throw this one at you. Out of your entire time, be it as a player, you debuted back in '75, right through your coaching. If I had to put you on a deserted island with three netballers from anywhere around the world of any era, who would you take with you? Oh, probably Marg Molina because she's the um, person that can sew and cook and do everything. Yeah. <laughs> and she's a manager so she can organise. <laughs> uh, Monia Gerard, she'd probably, you know, she'd crack me up every two minutes. Yeah. So she'd be really good. And the third one, oh, 
you could toss a coin, it could be half a dozen more. But I, I reckon, um, yeah, yeah, I'd have to have a real think about the third one. Um, it'd have to be someone that could, uh, you know, keep a sense of humour, even maybe you, mate. You, you yeah, would I be could, actually I'll bring my guitar <laughs> so we can have some sing-alongs, That's okay? Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, speaking of Marg Molina, you, that, you know the story about... Oh, mate, I love that story. <laughs> can you yes, tell me? That yes, I can. Right. So what happened was, uh, for everybody that's not sure, but Marg Molina was um, my team manager and uh, for the Australian team. And um, in the Christmas of, uh, you know, coming into 2003 and four, it was the tsunami and they were in Phuket her and her husband. And uh, Marg tells the story is that she was, you know, standing on at the bus stop with Anthony, her husband, and she heard this roar and then looked up and saw this wave and she said to Anthony, run. Well, neither of them could run very fast, <laughs> you know, <laughs> even then, but, mm. uh, but they get wiped out. And she described it as like she was under the water and she was going around like she was in a washing machine and she couldn't get up to get air, you know, but when they got dumped, then finally, both of them found themselves in sort of a swampy area, and Auntie had um, like a stick right through his leg, and Marg said that, you know, all her clothes are half ripped off, and she's only got her bras and panties, she was probably lucky to have her panties left on, and, um, you know, they finished up in the hospital, but uh, you were able to get shipped out, you know, like fairly early, but she got... Um, it absolutely smashed her shoulder and she had to have um, all of this um, nerve connection to the shoulders. And she was in a lot of pain for a long time. But I said to her, I'm going to keep this job open for you. You've just got to get right. And she told me later on that that was one of the things that kept her striving because she said if she had a gun, she might have shot herself. The pain was that bad. But anyway, she decided with her daughters that she'd go up to um, Byron Bay there to one of those relaxation resorts. And, uh, and uh, of course, when you go in, you've got to go in and sit down with a supervisor who's going to look after you and that. And so she's talking and looking at Margaret's form and she's saying, my God, you really have had an awful lot of injuries here, like uh, with all this and this. And Mark said, yeah, I was you know, probably through, this, you know, I got hit by the tsunami and, uh, you know, this is the result. And then the girl sort of, Mark said, the girl sort of stopped and laughed and she thought, oh, well, she's got a sense of humour, you know, so she thinks that's funny. And then next minute, you know, Mark went on again and, and then she said something and Mark said, well, you know, the tsunami threw us around in the water and the, she said the girl's face because she turned around and said to her, oh, Margaret, I'm so sorry. I thought you said you got hit by a, a salami <laughs> and all we could think of was this dirty big piece of salami. Uh, smash, smash. And we were sitting in the Qantas Club and she's told the story. Honestly, we laughed and laughed and laughed. I mean, can you believe it? She said she thought she by a I know. I've heard her tell the story. I had tears rolling down. She tells it better. To come out of an experience like that with <laughs> the sense of humour that Marg has, kudos to her, hey? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. She's, uh, and, and she did. And we used to have, like, you know, the girls that at the end of training always throw, um, soon get the goal from the centre circle, centre uh, court circle. And, uh, but we'd let Marg stand under the circle and try and shoot with her until yeah. she built her arm up, you know, because it took a long time for her to even be able to get it up, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So um, I think it was fantastic for her to have that. It took her mind off it. Yeah. Plum, do you want to give a shout out to your hairdresser? <laughs> uh, well, I've already seen her once, so <laughs> I've been lucky. But, I, you know, it's like, because she actually works from home, so she only has one person at a time yeah. at the moment. But, um, yeah, I, I think uh, it's going to be longer in between. I might be able to wear my hair as long as yours and, well, hey, and put, me sunnies, put me sunnies up here because yeah, that's, you know, me. <laughs> that's your style. But um, we'll wait and see. You, you've, had, you've had 
you're the iconic coach, as in, you know, if, if you draw a cartoon, it's easy to draw a cartoon of Norma Plummer. You've, you've had the iconic hair. So did you ever think coming through that you'd be so iconic? No, actually, the, the hairdo, I, I don't know why everybody thinks that. It's just that I can't really do it any other way. No, you it, know? I mean, it looks great. It's unreal. But I just, like, don't ever change it because it's just you. Well, I know everybody says to me they know it's me, <laughs> you know, because I don't look any different. But, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not adventurous, you know, with haircuts, never ever was. I always used to wear it a lot shorter than this, though, when I played. Yeah. Yeah. I used to sweat like, you know, I looked like I'd just come out of the shower every time I played. So that's been a reason I've probably kept short hair because yeah. I can't stand it around, you know, if I do get hot, you know, yeah. I've got to be able to clean put the bobby pin in flick it back yeah and Mom, i must say you know, there was one night i had to jump on the court melbourne we we're playing melbourne we we're playing you whoever you were playing with at the time yes, um, and, and we got an injury and we were short because i think the australian players were away yeah. and i had to jump on the court what i should have done is walked into center and i walked onto wing attack and i've had to play on you and all you did was laugh the whole bloody time but you know what you did you went up in the air and landed on my big toe Yep. And that big toe is always spread. And I never ever had anything done with it. But now it's growing a bunion. And it's your fault because you spread my toe. Hey, you can name it, just name it Gordy. I'll be with you for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> I will. That's a good one. But the Gordy's on the foot, yeah. Let, let's tell another story. This is another Gordy. I'm really enjoying this. It's going to go for longer. So hang in there, everyone. Um, so... I was, um, I headed to the AIS as uh, Simone McInnes' assistant coach. And then when Simone moved on to Tanzania, I um, headed up the AIS program and you were in the office. We, we basically had offices just about yeah. next door to each other. You were coaching the Diamonds at the time. Um, I had organised a practice match or actually the, um, with the England team. Sue Hawkins was coaching it at the time. And... Um, she had sent me an email, if you recall, because I did show you, that said that she was happy to come to Canberra to play against the AIS, but at no stage could Norma Plummer, the current Australian Diamonds coach, be anywhere within the vicinity. And if you were, that the England team would simply stop playing and they would leave the court. So I come down and I tell you, and I, I can't. I won't say what your response was because it's not for this time slot. <laughs> but what I did have to do is I had to go and tell the kids, um, and so I had to explain to them because I was unsure as to what you were going to do. You had threatened to possibly pop your head in, so I told the kids that you know if by chance Plum turns up, England are likely to walk off the court. Anyhow, you didn't turn up, but we did tell the kids something different. Oh, really? Yes. What did you tell them? Well, we told them that you were up on the roof of the AIS spying. <laughs> Do you remember this? Oh, vaguely. <laughs> we told the AIS <laughs> group from up, high. from up a high and that you'd gone and coordinated with the facilities to get a ladder to put you up on the roof so you could spy down from the top of the roof onto the England netball team. And the <laughs> kids believed it hooked line and sink oh seven know. days seven days we kept them going <laughs> i wouldn't have even been able to climb up on the yeah. roof <laughs> and, and um, you know what? i probably wouldn't have gone uh, i actually um you know do one of those sort of requests i, I actually wouldn't have gone out to watch them because i don't i don't believe i have to watch an opposition to beat them yeah. I think if I train my team on how I want, and I know I have that much history on them anyway, that I, I don't need to be there to see it. So, right. Next Aussie coach is about to go through the process and be announced. Your thoughts, I've seen on another chat, you've said, Simone, you believe, is that still correct? Yeah, is that where yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Who, who else do you think? I mean, who else do you think is out there that could do the job? Um. Oh, like, I, I guess Vicky Wilson's another one that might put a hand up and, uh, you know, she's had um, a lot more experience worldwide now, you know, with the coaching she's done. So, you know, and I think Vic is open to, you know, she doesn't bury her head in the sand. Um, and I, I, because I think these days, um, you know, I think 
you need to have a sounding board for different people. And sometimes I'm not sure uh, that some of the people that they get take for the sounding board is actually going to be able to help them because you've, you've got to know all about a lot of the off court when you're playing some of these countries as well, especially New Zealand and what goes on there. You know, I know I wouldn't have won 2007, uh, no, sorry, 2011 World Championships if I hadn't have picked up what was happening with the umpires there. So, you know, you, you really have to um, be smart about the game and it's not all about on court. You've got to be one step ahead all the time. So people that have been there know it, you know, would be a help to any any coach that goes forward. And But Bryony Arkell, I think, will be a very good coach for the future. I've been quite impressed with her. Yeah, yeah, she's coming through really nicely. Um, but it would be interesting to see if we get any um, outsiders put in. Well... That was that was my question because there you know our our game now is is as strong internationally as it's ever been. What stops someone from what stops a Wai Tamanu sitting over in New Zealand putting her hand up? Yeah, well I reckon Nolan would have if she hadn't have taken the New Zealand job. So yeah. there you are. You know, yeah. I think uh, whether we'll give it to one of them or not, I'm I'm actually not sure about that. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if Australia's ready to hand over to another country as yet. I think we're a bit too proud, Plum. <laughs> well, you know, I'd hate to think we went past one of our own that was good enough yeah. for somebody on the outside. Yeah. Hey, um, two, two things before we finish up. Number one, um, how much are you impressed by Suncorp Super Netball? I love it. Um, you know, I'd been asked a few times, you know, about, about the imports. And uh, look, I had imports when I was um, coaching... Um, the diamonds as well, you know, it's a little bit more open slather now, but um, I can remember saying to Robert Shaw, you know, the who was president of Nepal Australia, look, it's fine to bring him in and I'm loving it, you know, because the adversity and just watching the whole game, you know, and the strength and the different styles is great, which is every, what everybody's saying. Um, but I said, if you don't fix up that A&L and make that um, one of the most... Um, outstanding development programs and not run for seven weeks. It's got to be a full competition with finals, make it like, um, like college football, uh, college NBA, you know, in the States where the crowds turn up for that just as much as they would to see the diamonds. So that will then keep developing, developing what I would believe would be fantastic talent that we already have. But unfortunately, I don't get to see it these days. So I'm lacking in who's coming through. But I think, you know, if you could build that up, then the imports might struggle to actually get in the door because well, they are yeah. so good and they've got to be able to take on the court and be as good or better. Yeah, correct. So, yeah. But we've got to do the work for with them. Yeah, no, I am I 100% back you there. And I actually also think it's a contributing factor to where... Uh, New Zealand have had improvements. So their Beko Netball League, which wasn't in existence some four years or five years ago, was was the change in their pathway, uh, similar to what the ANL is and the depth of their program that's really pushing their upper level has been such a huge change for them. Yeah, but, you know, the biggest factor, they took the money and ran and dropped the AIS, yeah. Susie. The AIS developed everything we want. So you look at the players that have been through the AIS that represented Australia because they're on a, a daily training environment on scholarship. They were, we were farming it through a hell of a lot quicker and at a sensational a standard that they could just step on the court and, and look like they'd been in the top play, uh, the top team the whole time. Like, seriously, um, I think that's been where... Basketball have kept their programs at the AOS and, you know, you look at the Opals, they're right up there, you know, winning. And it's only the, the USA that's knocking them off practically. So, you know, I think we, we had something that no other country had and now we've dropped the ball. So we thought we'd sit back and have a look. This is myself and all the other coaches. I'd said about five years. It's, well, I think it's been less now. And uh, there you are. We do not own... We do not own one gold medal. We do not own the World Youth Cup. We do not own Commonwealth Games. And we do not own a world championship. And that is the first time in the history of the sport. So, yeah, there had to be change. And I'd love to see the AIS back. 
very topical plum. There's a fair bit of news going around through the ASC at the moment. If you, I'm sure you read the papers and whatnot, it'll be very interesting to see what happens in that space going forward because I think the whole that whole area is under the microscope. So, hey, listen, yeah. one more thing for you before I know you're going to have to sing karaoke for me so you don't get away from here without doing that. So I'm just giving you some prep time. Warm yourself up. Hey, uh, so your last little bit of stint before being thrown into lockdown uh, was hanging out with England in mentoring their new coach, uh, Jess yep. Derby. So is that, is that where you see, is that, is that the plan for you going forward? Well, you know, funny enough, I never, I've never chased a job. So, you know, it's like um, uh, when I finished with the Diamonds, um, Anna Mays from England asked me to, um, you know, mentor her. Um, but she only had the job then for another, about another 12 months after that. So that, um, unfortunately, I was a little bit worried and, you know, God, I was mentoring and she got the sack. So that yeah. did worry me. And then... Um, the um, the other side of it, I was working with Jess Thurlby, who she was head of Bath. So I did about three weeks with her in a, with her club uh, situation at uh, the university, um, and and then South Africa sort of came along, and they kept ringing me about you know coaching them. So I thought it'd be a great challenge, and I loved it. It was sensational. Mm. But then you know. I was trying to do the right thing after world champs and say, well, now South Africa, it's your time to let your own coach go in. We work with quite a few of the coaches because they need their own coach sitting on the bench at the 2023 world champs. You know, I think it'd be a shame that they didn't have their own coach sitting there. So, you know, we, Nick and I had decided that that would be it, but we were there to assist if we needed, but, um, and then never heard anything from them. So, <laughs> Jess kept ringing me and asking me would I, you know, step in and work with her. And I said, oh, well, fair enough. I haven't heard from South Africa. So I did. Yeah. Whether or not mentoring's for me, a lot of sitting around, mate, and a lot of watching and a lot of not doing. So, um, you know, you're there to advise, support, um, make suggestions, but you're not actually coaching. And, and that's fair enough because that's not the role. But, yeah, we'll see. I've, you know, it's, it's like a... Um, a session by session um, yeah. project at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Would you would you take way it is now? I don't think we'll have any international this year. Yeah. Would you take another start. coaching job? I'm very very up, like <laughs> capable of doing it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, look, I don't know. It'd have to be what yeah. was presented to me. You yeah. Know. yeah. It'd have to be the. It'd have to be the Mickey Mouse job, wouldn't it be? Oh, well, no, like, I mean, you wouldn't have called South Africa the Mickey Mouse job. No, but I meant like... <laughs> what it turned out to be the Mickey Mouse job when we got them there and, and we made everybody in the world stand up and look at this talent. They have talent. Yeah. What about if uh, Jamaica rang, champ? Sorry? What about if, if Jamaica who? picked the phone up? Well, well I, I just said I felt that uh, Jamaica has always been there. They just haven't, you know, actually got themselves over the line. And I don't know why, because, you know, like they all used to go off years ago. They used to go into the States and play basketball or volleyball to be on scholarship so they'd get an education. And then before the world champs in July, they would come back, have two weeks together, go to the world champs, play Australia and New Zealand uh, and England. And next minute, like we're only winning by five goals, three goals. And it, like, They've only just got together. Yeah. That's how good they are. Mm. But that that has not hasn't given them the X factor to get over the line. And they should have by now. Mm. My God, they should have. See, I'll, I'll tell you, like um, that was the biggest hurdle I had for the Proteas this year, like oh last year at the World Champs. Because if we didn't get over Jamaica, we wouldn't have even made the four. And the objective was I wanted to get them into the four. Yeah. You know. Um, Nolly got him into the gold medal, though. Two goals, we dipped out. By Christ, I'd love to have won that. Yeah. But anyway, um, the uh, the situation <clears throat> for them was that they were playing um, all the teams, you know, they cruised along. We had a couple of easy games. But our draw was the toughest. Yeah. We had everybody ranked seventh and up. And then Australia and New Zealand had everybody ranked seventh and down. 
So they had all these easy games. Well, we were getting pushed all the time. And um, when it got to Jamaica, though, I did say to my girls, when they walked in Jamaica, you know, they were dancing, singing, rocking to themselves. And I said to the girls, you know what? This team's not ready. They're, they're actually thinking this is going to be a walk in the park and they haven't played a team yet that's going to work the ball low and hard and you keep it out of the air and let's actually nail it, you know, and actually work them. Maybe had them running, you know, to half time. I think it was, I don't know, 20 goals to 11 or something. And I knew they'd come back and they made a few switches and, and everything which they did. Yeah. And that third quarter, I'm thinking, oh, God, no, come on, come on. We can't let them back in the door. But we got over the line. And honestly, that is a team just underestimating it. Now, you never underestimate your opposition. It's the yeah. worst thing any coach can ever do. Yeah. And yeah. we won that game because, seriously, on paper with Fowler there, we shouldn't have been able to probably take it. And we did. And with the you know, experience they had. Well, Connie Francis gets that job now, so or has that job now. And, and I've spoken to a couple of Jamaican girls and they're excited the fact that she's been appointed and, and they feel like maybe, you know, things can get on track for them. So we'll wait and see. Plum, it's time. Oh, my God. Have you got a song? You know with karaoke, don't you? Hey, eh? You know with karaoke that they always play the tune and they have the words coming up. Right? So, excuse me. Oh, I'm going to Jimmy Barnes, Nina Turner, and I've got my words here. Go for it. Hey, love this. Oh, yeah. And I need you. It's on fire. I love this song. You come to me, come to me, wild and wild. You come to me, give me everything I see. Give me a lifetime of promises and a world of dreams. Speak the language of love that you know what I need. Mm, you can't be wrong. Take my heart and keep it strong, baby. Here we go. Sing it to me, Plum. It's simply the best thing. Better than all the rest. Better than anyone. Anyone I ever made. Oh, Norman Plum, I give it up for Norman. Turn off, folks. Oh, Jimmy, you won't shut up. Oh. <laughs> Give it to Brooke. Oh, do, you know that, do you know that was Phoenix's song? Um, and we won the, the 1996 End of Super League. And then the next year was the first of the Commonwealth Bank Trophy. And we won that. Yeah. And that was the theme song. And yeah. I've always loved what, it. What a song to Jimmy choice. Barnes and Tina. Yeah, together. what a perfect song choice from you, Plum. This... <laughs> has been nothing short of brilliant. I know everyone is absolutely going to love this. Some of the stories told, never been heard before, certainly on Gordy's Gas Bags. But, hey, listen, big thanks for your time. Um, yeah. I haven't even asked you about COVID-19, but I know you're cleaning up your house and you're doing stuff like that. But stay safe, stay I'm well, really and let's get the hell out of this bloody COVID-19 yeah. disaster. And if I could just say to... A lot of the younger players out there, when you go to the pub, don't go singing. Your mother thinks you're ugly. You're ugly. You're ugly. <laughs> See you later, Norman Plumber. Bye.